three, two, one. Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. It is a Dear Andy slash Dear Ari edition of the show. We have lots of great questions from you guys, and uh, we're, we're kicking off with Dear Ari questions because, to be honest, all you guys want to ask about is this NIL deal that, that Stuart Mandel wrote about last week, and uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy, and you know it's one of those things that we didn't exactly know how any of this was going to work, and now we're sort of getting an idea of how things work, and uh, it, it just really often brings up more questions. So I will start with a question about that from Daniel. Ari, will the five-star recruit Stuart Mandel wrote about receiving a huge deal from a collective be eligible for a senior season of high school this fall? If not, how will that affect his recruitment? I'm looking at a map right now because um, some states, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's eligible. You're allowed to he do He is this eligible. And, and look, listen – we, we we are our Stuart wouldn't reveal who it is. We have an educated guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you know that we're gonna say, but I think let's put it this way. My if you want to see what my educated guess is, go to the comments under Stuart's story. And the sleuths there, I I feel like came up with the same educated guess very quickly. Yeah, yeah, I. Here's the thing. I don't know if we have to talk about the specific person. Um, it doesn't the, matter. The I, thing that yeah. doesn't matter. The thing is, is that in half the states, not half, most of the states, you would be ineligible. You would and not be allowed. there are some forward-thinking states yep. where it makes no difference. And I wrote a lot about this, and we spoke about it when Quinn Ewers made his decision to leave high school early. Because Texas is one of the states that idiotically doesn't yep. permit it. There's only and, there, there are only two really good high school football states. But no, no, there's, there's three, because because one of them is is surprisingly good, and people don't realize how good it is. But there are three great high school football states that allow it, but arguably arguably the three best high school football states prohibit it. What are the what are the three states? California and New Jersey. California, New Jersey, and Utah. Utah has really yeah. good high school football. So. <clears throat> Those are the three, and, and they're not all – I think there are seven that are confirmed permitted. So I'm looking at the map right now, and this is from our friends at Open Door. So uh, you heard Blake Lawrence on the show the other day. Um, Alaska, California, Utah, Nebraska, Kansas, New York, New Jersey. And it looks like Maine is permitted but not confirmed permitted. So I don't think there's a ton of – football recruits in Maine but yeah I can't remember were. writing or coming across a single recruit in Maine so that's the that's the 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 gist of it now there are certain states that are considering making it possible for high school players to have their own NIL deals and a few that this would make a big difference in in high school football and in recruiting specifically it looks like Oregon, Nevada, Idaho, Colorado, Arkansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Connecticut. I just think it's moronic. The college football world now has said, you know what? We're good with you making money as an well, you're, amateur. You're also opening yourself up to the same lawsuits that the NCAA was, was hit with. And if it actually becomes real, real money, the way it did with Quinn Ewers, they'll just leave early. So all you're right. doing is is opening the door for people to yeah. bounce out of your high school sports well, association. Faster. I guarantee you, the states of Texas, Georgia, and Florida, and Alabama, and Mississippi, and South Carolina are not going to look fondly upon their players going to different states because that's what will happen. Like if you are if you are a good player who could conceivably get an NIL deal that would that would start as a senior in high school if you're in a state that's prohibiting it you're going to move to a state that allows it and here's the thing andy too we talked a lot about nil uh leading up to it during it and then after it got passed and i always maintained that if you are the type of person who would make a short-sighted decision to go to a school based solely off of nil you're making a dumb decision because the 20 to 50 or even a hundred thousand um, dollars in the short term is not worth putting yourself in a worse position 
um, to get drafted. That said, if you now are in a position as an athlete to make $8 million over the course of a four-year period guaranteed, this is my understanding, if you stay at that school, that is a significant enough amount of money where I would make my decision based on that because you can still get drafted um, at any school that you go to if you're a very good football player. Um, and $8 million is a considerable enough amount of money for you if you use it wisely to live off of for the rest of your life at current price levels. Or at the very least, be comfortable for a long period you, of time. Think about it, if you invested a million of that well at age 20, and, and not even in anything risky, like in something that basically just kind of grows with the economy, you're going to, you can retire on that. I think if you put $5 million into an S&P 500 ETF, it spits out a hundred grand in dividends a year. I think you could live off of the dividends that you get in certain funds that will on average increase 7% per year. And that's actually my life's goal. If we're being honest to invest enough money into specific funds where I don't have to have a job and I can just live off of the dividends. Um, that it, but eight million dollars, I think, if that's the number that this is actually going to be, and I know that these aren't open, these aren't open records, and we don't know exactly, uh, you know, how it's all going to pan out. And sometimes the contracts are very difficult to understand, and thus families are going to have to hire lawyers to look over these documents. Well, no, they're not. Well, they, they probably are going to need want to do that too, but there will be an agent representing the player on a deal like this, yeah, right which is in turn going to cost you money now and down the road. Um, so it's not going to, it's not going to cost you money. It, I mean, it will cost you a percentage of it, but the, the yeah, agent I mean, who represents this type of player does not demand an upfront fee. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you'll pay for it at some point. Yes. You uh, will. You will as yeah. a percentage of your, of your income. I'm yes. paying a uh, accountant right now, $375 an hour to look over something for me. And it's not that complicated, but like that to me, but you want to make sure you get it right. <laughs> I need to get it right. And that's and also know, that's that also paying in. that accountant puts that accountant on the hook legally if something goes wrong instead of you. That's good. And I'd say that's a pretty valuable $375 an hour. At yeah, it depends point. on how many hours uh, it is. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, where I'm at with it. But $8 million to me is enough money to you know what? I'm going to get recruited by Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, USC, and Arizona State's going to pay. Well, not Arizona State because they're going to focus on developing players. But let's say Arizona is going to spend million. <laughs> I'm going to Arizona. I Can mean, like, talk about I'm, how dumb that was to say. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And, and, and you're a former agent. Why are you saying that? Also, you don't differentiate yourself in that regard. No. It's not from a program that has a long track record of exceeding the average output for NFL draft stuff. So I, I, I we could talk about that for an hour. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But I would pick any Power 5 school over the traditional power if they were going to pay me that much money. I think that's, a, I think $8 million, because what, what's the dream for getting drafted, Andy? Is the dream to be famous and to play the game at a professional level or to get rich? It's to get and rich. If can, so if you can circumvent that, and again, $8 million isn't nearly as much as uh, what Christian Kirk spent eight Christian Kirk. Everyone's talking about, he, he sent an $18 million deal, right? Uh, annually. No, that that's, that's his guaranteed money, guaranteed money, but you're already at 50% of what the second richest contract in the, uh, NFL is paying a slot receiver. So, I mean, you're already starting to get into that realm of long-term financial stability. And then on top of that, it doesn't rule you out of actually getting drafted. Like if a five-star quarterback went to Arizona and was really good, or at least displayed the measurables to have the potential of being very good, you'll still get paid NFL money. So like I would pick going to Arizona or Utah or TCU or any of the $20 million signing bonus, 37 million guaranteed over the life of the deal. Yeah. And it could be 80 million if he, if he stays healthy and plays throughout the entire contract. Right. Uh, 72 million yeah yeah but the, so, the thing I mean, the thing to remember about all nfl contracts is the last usually the last two years are uh are fake but what's your number My what's number? your number your number if you're a high school recruit do you say you know what i'm not going to alabama i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to baylor i'm gonna go there's to a pre- there's a premium like that school is gonna have premium? to pay a premium to keep me away from alabama or georgia or is ohio state where Clearly, they make first rounders. Uh, yeah, there's a number. 
Eight million is probably right around that number. Yeah, I take that. Yeah, I think that that it, it, like if we get into a world where prospects are getting offered eight million dollar deals over the course of a single college career, then it turns into what people are afraid of, and that's fine. I'm not saying it's, it's good funny or bad. Because people are people are afraid of it, thinking that it will just further reinforce the hierarchy. If you look at those educated guesses under Stewart's story, and again, I have a similar educated guess, it's not one of those schools. Those schools are going to catch up, though. Sure. Uh, but here's my thing about that, and, and I get that everybody's afraid of it. I really don't care. If someone's willing to pay it, then that's what they're worth. If it is the educated guess that you're guessing, and I think we're on the same page, I think it's awesome. Right, because then it might redistribute this stuff. I Or, listen, this could bomb spectacularly. We don't know if this player is going to be good or not. Do you think, because it's a collective, and people are donating their money and helping right. funnel the money in, that this is a long-term regularity, or do you think this is a premature overreaction to the market? I think this is a premature overreaction, and we're we're probably going to see some similar deals, but then the market will normalize. As, as you find out what other collectives are willing to pay. And also, the collectives, I don't know that they've examined the risk. And I, I, I've got, I'm working on something for next week where I'm examining the risk of five-star prospects by position. And I think if you're smart, and this is what I, honestly, this is what I think that the established programs are going to do because they're smarter than the other ones and they've always been smarter than the other ones. There are certain position groups that, hit much more regularly than others when you're talking about five-star prospects. They're going to buy you do those the, positions. Did you do the math on that? We're working on I'm working on it now. It's it, This is my weekend project. I'd be very, I, very curious because I think I know the, the positions. I, the I, have, my head. I have input most of the players. You don't want to give and it away, I assume. But I don't want to give it away, but let's let's be honest. We know this. Anybody who follows the sport knows that five-star quarterbacks are a risky investment. Yeah, but also on the flip side of it, the most worthy. Uh, they have the highest payout, right? They have the highest payout because it's not and it's not just if this person becomes a first rounder, especially with quarterback. If you're a Heisman finalist, that's a massive pop for your university. That's a massive pop for your football program. And you've probably won your team some games at that point. So that's worth it. But if you never throw a pass for that school or you never start there, well, obviously that's not worth it. So yeah, that's the tricky part. I will say that it seems fairly universal that if you are six foot six and 310 pounds and move well in high school, there's a very, very good chance you will be a good college football player and play in the NFL. Yeah, that was the position I was thinking. The variability is not is not the same. Because it's the most pure Right. Position. It's it's right. it's it's dollars and cents. It's like it's like what do you think is the most pure lift in the weight room? The the deadlift, back squat, power clean, bench press. I would say bench press. Yeah. Because it's you laying down, you put your arms on a bar and you push as hard as you can and you can lift what you can lift. And that really describes I, most lifts, but I don't know. I, I've been lifting weights a lot in the last you know, few months, and there are a lot of uh, exercises in the last few months. Like I'm an expert now. Uh, but there are a lot of exercises that are just awkward, that like don't feel yes. good even if I didn't have a weight in my hand. But I, I, a lot I would of tricep the back, exercises, I would argue. The back squat or the deadlift is a more pure measure of strength than a bench press. Yeah, but I just feel like as a person, it's just – up and down. That's it. You know, it's not. Yes. People, people understand that. Yes. Yeah. But what, I, what I think is going to happen is a market, the market will regulate itself. The more the market will, will adjust as, as things go. And it will be very similar in concept, but not the same in specifics to how the NFL draft market works. Like you don't see a lot of running backs go in the first round now because you can find valuable running backs later. You can find good running backs in the third round and the fourth round. 
You can't find good defensive tackles later, usually. You can't find good offensive tackles. You can't find good quarterbacks. You can't find good defensive ends. With this, I think it will be basically who's the safest bet, and we're going to go in on those versus the so ones that are very hit or miss. Is that if you're a tight end, you're never going to sign an $8 million deal. Oh, see, I think – well – See, I think Brock Bowers would be an incredibly valuable person in that kind of market because of the way offenses have gone, because there are so few, like it's scarcity a is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Scarcity yeah. is a huge deal. Tight ends don't get drafted in the first round very often, but when they do, they're unicorns. Yeah. Kyle, like Kyle Pitts. Pitts. Yeah. But, but I, I think the dumb money is going to go after quarterbacks. I really do. Because... You everybody's there is like a scarcity have, of quarterbacks, Andy. There is, but there's also an abundance of five star washouts. I know, but if there's so many on average, just off the top of my head, six five star prospects per cycle at the quarterback position, mm -hmm. I think those are always going to be very lucrative positions. And I think that it would be smart, it would be huge. I think, but I think those are the deals that are going to blow have the, the biggest chance of blowing up in your face. So, speaking of the dumb money in, in recruiting. Or the money in recruiting. That brings me to my next question from Dominic. When it comes to recruiting possibilities, who's the biggest sleeping giant? Because I think this is an NIL question too. This is not necessarily a, yeah. oh, if they just hire the right coach question. This is a, if this school gets going and they really want to want to get dudes, do they have the, the fan base motivated enough, the system in place to pay it, which schools can do that? See, it's funny that you mentioned this as an NIL thing because um, what is the school – like if you took NIL out of the equation, mm -hmm. what is the school that hops out to you two years ago? Because I've got three. Texas A&M. Or were they already too high of a level? I mean, they already recruited really the top ten classes yeah. uh, in the past. I mean, yeah. I, I, I could see what you, you're well, saying. Well, North Carolina, I think you would but say. But A&M strikes me as the post-NIL answer. Right, right. If they count. North Carolina, I think you would say, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the one that jumps out to me in terms of school that's the biggest sleeping giant would be uh, Arizona State. Oh, yeah. Okay. To me, uh, Arizona State, players. and I don't know if this is like something that is just, since I grew up there and it was visible to me, is something that stands out to me, but they are close enough to a very fertile recruiting area for them to be very attractive to a lot of very good, you know, Driving on the yes. 10 West isn't or East isn't that uh, daunting of a job. No, no. And and the thing is, like, you can get some of what you need right there in Phoenix. A lot of what you need at the most important play. positions. Um, yeah. And then it's also a very attractive place to live. Um, and right. And in, in the modern era of recruiting, it's not just how yeah. close are you to players. It's how desirable of a place. Yeah, it's a big, be. nice city. Everything around there yeah. is new and nice. Like it, it's, it blows my mind that Utah can win the Pac-12, but Arizona State can't compete for it. And it's like maybe that's just because Kyle Whittingham, as our friends over at the Audible, ranked coaches. Which I don't know if we'd be impeding on their um, on their territory, but ranking the coaches, I was listening to that show and I had some differing opinions. Um, we but we probably should have Bruce or Stu on and, and argue with them about that. Kirby Smart was three on both of their lists, and I almost crashed my car on the side of the road. Because you would have him number two behind Saban? Yes. Without, I don't because even think it's a recruiting. debate. Yeah. Yeah. Dabo was still two. That. Dabo was still two for them. And I understand that. He's won multiple national championships, and he built, he did the one thing that no one's really done. Right. He's Take, turned, he's he, turned a school yeah. from a, from a middle class or an upper middle class to a, to a, you know, a, yeah. And a king, I, as and, Stewart says, a king, a kings and barons. But how long do you, you know, you get new information every year. How long do you give him that benefit before you turn the page? And I think I would have given him that benefit 12 months ago. I think it's time to turn the page. Um, that's just my personal opinion because of well, where we, George we, is. We can get into that and, and we, sh we should have Bruce or Stewart on and, and we'll talk about that. We also need to re-rank the, uh, the, the coaching jobs in each conference. Mm -hmm. We did that last year. But conferences have realigned, and and some circumstances have changed. So new conferences. That's something Andy. I think. What's that? New conferences means new 
new that's debates. New rankings, new job yeah. rankings. That's exactly right. But so back we'll, to the question, though. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, I, so it is the post-NIL era, though. So who who are the schools that could potentially recruit differently now? I've got a couple in mind that I think the, the fan bases are motivated, that they will – so two SEC schools that jump out to me because – they the fans crave a winner. They are the biggest thing going where they are, and they will fund these things and probably be somewhat smart about it. Arkansas and Tennessee. Both those schools have money, have motivated fans, fans willing to spend on this. I think the crave factor is huge. Yes. Like how much does your fan base crave a change? Yeah. And those are those are places that could get good players before in kind of fits and starts. But they could actually organize something where they could put together very attractive packages for players that are maybe considering schools that have had more success. And they go, you know what? Your number sounds good to me. I'll go. When I was in high school, Tennessee was the shit. Yeah. Like they were, that was like, if you got it recruited by Tennessee – you were at the top of the top. And well, I think they, if you, they recruited nationwide, the, you know, yeah. like when I was covering Tennessee, they went everywhere. They'd go to Virginia Beach. They'd go to, to the Bay Area. Like uh, Kevin Simon, they recruited out of the Bay Area. He was a five-star linebacker from De La Salle. Uh, they'd go to Texas. They, they'd go anywhere. And it's so close and, to Ohio, too. But I don't think people realize how, how close it is to Ohio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, What's you, not you so, like drive a four and a half five hours, hours and, and be in Ohio. It'd yeah. be in Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, Tennessee's a good one. Yeah, it's like... Would Nebraska like, be one? They're certainly motivated. Yeah, like the NI... It's like the NIL sleeping giant thing is so interesting to me because it's so different from the conventional thinking of, like, Maryland, maybe? That would be interesting because you're you're in a big money area. You're basically in D.C., Uh I, how how motivated are their alums to win? That's and that's I don't know the if it's a basketball school more so than a yeah. football school. But doesn't yeah. is doesn't the founder of Under Armour is he a Maryland grad? He's a former walk on at Maryland. So you know, to me, it's just like, can you do East Coast Oregon stuff there? It seemed like they were yeah. trying. They were trying. What, what about what about Michigan State? Because that is a, much, that is a rabid fan base. How much are you are you taking into account geographical things right now? Is it like out the window because all we're thinking about is money, or is it? Uh, it's less. It's less important because of the money. I think it still matters, but it's less important. Michigan State's an interesting. It's an interesting thought. It's like to me, I think that Texas A and M is the number one sleeping right. Party. But Goblin, they're, not a, they're not a sleeping giant. They just had the number one recruiting yeah, yeah. class. They're, they're yeah, there. They're somebody awake. would argue that the 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 giant really awoke last year. Yeah. Um. What about? I don't know. USC also but already USC, does it. USC yeah. was already recruiting at or allegedly recruiting at a high level. Miami. You expect nothing less. Miami. Miami's one. Yeah. Um, and that's that's one thing I will say, putting in the data so far for this five-star project that I'm doing, Miami used to sign a lot more five-stars than they do now. Or, you know and, who, and be in the mix for a lot more. I don't know if this is a sleeping giant because I just don't know if it's possible, but what about uh, Rutgers? That's one of the... Listen, we always say if they could ever get the best players in New Jersey to all stay home, they'd be fine. They'd be a really good program. Yeah. So could you could are are in, are their fans motivated enough to make that happen? That's that's the question. It's all in theory, but even then, yeah, I don't know if you. Well, and that's the thing we we don't know. I mean, all of this nil stuff, we are just guessing. Like we are guessing at how this is going to work. I don't remember anybody saying when nil came into existence because look, we're not Pollyannas here. We knew that when all that passed, that they were going to use it. People were going to use it to buy players. But I didn't know that the way they would do it would be you buy someone's NIL rights lock, stock, and barrel, which is how that deal that Stewart wrote about went down. But here's, here's the thing, too. It's like anytime you crack that door open, it doesn't matter whether it's NIL or any other rule. 
the way college football works is you pass a rule and there's a there's a gray area always of how you could make the most of that rule and and get the most out of it it's like of course now that there's there's an opening they're going to blow it open they're going to blow a hole yeah. right through it so that makes sense and like somebody asked me like do you think they'll be able to regulate this and i said like, i don't i'm sure they would like to but i don't even know how you do it well the only way you could regulate it is that you get a national law passed and this congress is not going to do that it's got other things going on and and if it did pass one it would not be what the schools want so they're not even pushing for it right now or you collectively bargain with the players like you you could create all kinds of rules if you wanted to bargain with the players but the problem is how do you how do you certify one bargaining unit for the players when you've got a bunch of state universities that have you know they have to deal with their own state employment laws and how how they're required to deal with unions and that sort of thing it's not like the nfl or major league baseball where they can just sit down with the players union and, and hammer it all out yeah you're still you're still potentially going to get sued and, like, and that's what they're afraid of what's the stop phil knight from just buying a burger place and paying anybody however you want how much you know it's like it what if it's a collective I, I will tell you the only thing that would stop phil knight in particular now i i realize he's not day to day with nike anymore but if phil knight were to buy all of the best players for oregon if i were michigan i would cancel my nike contract i would be like i would be like we're in adidas school now like I, if i were if i were alabama if i were florida if i were texas if I were Oklahoma, I would cancel my Nike contract immediately. I'm like, okay, you're going to buy all the players for one school? We're not doing business with with your with your company anymore. I wonder. I how think that would we... probably stop it pretty quick. Yeah, that's a good idea. I never thought of that. Yeah, Northwestern. <sighs> are they motivated enough? I don't know. So it's all. So it's, it's a, basically the question is which fan bases are the most motivated to change? And I think Tennessee would be number one. Tennessee, Arkansas, and Nebraska jump off the page yeah. if we're talking about that. Texas? But again, yes. I don't know if they're already recruited. They should well. have been doing – like, I would argue that Texas has recruited at a high level, but they're really bad at picking players and then bad at developing them. I think A&M is probably the most motivated. Yes, I would agree. Like, which, and, if, and, you a, seen if, it. If, you, if you played a game uh, – where you just lined up all the fans and, uh, and there was a representative of every fan base and they were wearing that t-shirt and they did mm -hmm. a tug of war uh, one by one tournament of which team and, and your strength is measured by how bad you want your team to how be passionate. Yeah, yeah. How bad like, you want Texas it. Yeah. A&M would just automatically win that, right? They win that tournament. Yeah. Yeah. And Tennessee would be Although, I like Alabama finals. and Georgia are going to fare very well in that tournament too. Not only the teams that are down right now. Okay, okay, yeah. That'd be a fun tournament. I'd watch that. It would. The tug of war? Yeah, I, I definitely have the Aggies there. Nebraska and Tennessee are going to be pretty pretty motivated, too. Like the, I think that you probably wind up with the Texas A&M-Tennessee final in that one. I don't, it depends on how the bracket breaks down, but that, that would probably be your last two. Yeah, that's fun. That's a fun thing to think about. Oh, yeah. Here's another fun thing to think about, Ari. Crawford asks, one of the things that makes March Madness so great are the villains or the heels. Think Christian Leitner. Think UNLV. Who are college football's biggest villains? And I would have argued before December that there wasn't really a huge villain in college football. I guess Alabama winning all the time as a kind of – so Saban maybe. But people have changed their thinking on Saban – as they've realized, no, wait, this is probably just the greatest guy, the greatest of all time. So you can hate him when he's beating your team, but you respect him. That was just him. easy to answer. Yeah. Now it's Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley is the biggest villain in college football, and I want him to embrace it. Like, I want him to poke fun at the schools that he's recruiting against. I want him to rip on UCLA whenever possible. It's not in his personality to do it, but I'd love to see him just completely embrace this. There's what about Brett Bielema? He, you can't be that at Illinois, but yes, he will do it, and he'll be the he'll be a thorn in the side of. When of he was the at Wisconsin, was he the number Big one Ten villain, Lesson. or was it just me and my Ohio State land? No, no, I think he was. He probably was, uh, because the the true number one. I think the best villain of all time in college football is Steve Spurrier. 
there's never been a better villain because Steve Spurrier actually embraced the role. But it also brings you back to the same thing that we talked about a few weeks ago, which is why can't people just say stuff? Right, exactly. Coaches one, of, one of the one of the things that that you know one of my greatest heartbreaks in college football is that Will Muschamp did not win more as a head coach because if he had, he is funnier than Steve Spurrier. Like if you're sitting down talking to him, he's funnier than Steve Spurrier. But he kept that in check because he never felt like he'd won enough to just really let it rip. I got one for you. What about okay. Jim Har What about cocky Jim Harbaugh? Okay, that I was going to ask you about this. Is he even a villain anymore because when he was doing all the Twitter stuff, absolutely. And he and he seemed to be enjoying it. It was always aimed but, at Ohio State though. Right, but then he stopped. So I don't like if you if you're like antagonizing the well, I mean, after he beat Ohio State, he inferred that Ryan Bay Ryan Day was born on third base. That was like, okay. I mean, that was pretty the, good. The, yeah, and that's fine. You can you can think that. I think Whatever you want to say about that, you can say about that. But I don't know if that makes him a villain nationally. I I don't think he is anymore. I think he was at first. When he was antagonizing people about the satellite camps, he was. Yeah, because he was antagonizing SEC fan bases. And yeah, I, I he should keep doing that. Like, it's fun. Well, I, I realize that's why, the thing. You, can't, you it didn't, can't be a villain if you're losing. I don't think it helped him any. And I think that's why he stopped. He stopped because he was losing. There's no question. Right. Exactly. And, and the he, first thing that he wasn't did, doing him any good. So the first thing he did when he beat Ohio state was like, get back to that. It was like, literally he, he waited what 90 seconds yeah. from the, the post game to the podium. I think Kirby smart could be a villain if he wanted to, but he just, I, I don't think he cares. Yeah. And it's like, I like Nick Saban being in a conversation is just a resentment from other people that he's good. Like which, for Kirby Smart, the only, the only thing I can think about, think of that even was remotely villainous was the, the clip that we played right after the Florida Georgia game this year, where he said, you, you can't, you can't out coach talent. Like that was a direct shot at Dan Mullen. Inspired the question. That Dan Mullen's response to basically you can make the case fired. that that quote led to the end of the Dan Mullen era. I, I would I, I would completely agree that 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 Kirby Smart quote, if you just take it to its logical conclusion, it did lead to the end of the Dan Mullen era. And and so, but what maybe about, maybe Kirby's got a few more of those in him. Yeah. So what about player villains? You know, it's it's interesting because I I don't feel like. It's not like basketball where people just there, there's not a JJ Reddick type. I think Christian Wilkins got a little bit a bit of that when he was at Clemson. Was Johnny Manziel a villain or was he universally loved? Yeah, yeah. People thought Johnny Manziel like the non A and M money people didn't, the, didn't like you know you just showboat blah blah blah. By the way, if I was as good at football in college as Johnny Manziel was, I would <laughs> the act same exactly thing. the same way. So yeah. well, and and I wonder, do we get more of that now because the NIL piece of it. Like the bigger it's more you make your brand, to be that the way. bigger personality, yeah. the more money you can. How much NIL make? money would have Johnny Johnny Manziel? I think you you could make the case that him or Tim Tebow are the biggest would have oh, been the biggest 100 beneficiaries of that. Probably him, Tebow even more because he was a protagonist. Yeah, him, Tim Tebow, and Zion would have would have been the biggest beneficiaries of that. Was Zion the biggest college basketball star of the last ten years? Last 20. question. Last twenty. Yeah. I'd say he was a bigger star than Mello, and Mello took his team to the national title. Let me ask you this. Like, I'm very curious. Like, you're on Twitter, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. We follow different people. But is LeBron James a villain? To certain people, he is. Some people just hate like LeBron James. He's, I feel like for how good of a player that he is, he seems to be universally hated by a lot of people. Yeah, I think Maybe not universally. People, I think a lot of people just feel like he... That, they don't like that he essentially acts as his own GM, which he I also don't blame has an him opinion about. I'd do the same damn which, thing if I was the best player in the league. Like, yeah, I don't have an opinion on this, but I do think that people don't want him to talk about social issues, which is that, probably yeah, also part of it too. That's probably a lot of it, but yeah. look, it's his platform. He can talk about whatever he wants, yeah. and the it's not hurting him. <laughs> He's not losing endorsement deals over yeah. it. So, but it's just like. LeBron is a villain because he's been a mainstay in the sport and maybe the best player in the NBA for over a decade. Well, and, and, and there's also outspoken. people who don't like the fact that he like he's won championships with three different franchises. Like they want players to just stay yeah. where they are because they think that if, if they were in that position, they would just play for their favorite team. 
But that doesn't, that's not yeah. how it works in the real world. I just like, I don't know. And also, too, and as generations change, like the idea of showboating, like, I don't know why this happened. It's happened in the NFL, it's happened in college football. Why are we penalizing people for showboating? Like, because there's a certain segment of the population that doesn't want to see it. I, who's that? like, I don't trust the cornerback who doesn't talk shit. Andy, I want to <laughs> I see want somebody that. river dance into the end zone. I want right. to see Joe Horn pull the cell phone out. Right. Like, why are we pen- you, you always talk yeah. about this is your number one thing with me. Whenever we're yep. arguing about the expansion of the playoff or why even it's, on Twitter you came I, at me the I'm other with day you. with the shift. 100 percent What the it, this sports is an entertainment product and we want to be entertained. It's like who Bingo. doesn't want somebody to backflip into the end zone? Hell yeah. High yeah, step, I, turn around for all I care. Wave the ball in someone's face as you're crossing the goal line. That's what we want to watch. Why is that not allowed? What's what we want to talk about? Because because that is what you and I want to watch. But that's you the reason like why there's stuff. no villain, because they've outlawed villainy. Quote, unquote, <laughs> villainous behavior. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I think you're right. And I think in basketball, because you're not under a helmet, you can see, like, you get more of that. Like, nothing Joe Kim Noah did made him a villain other than people didn't like the way he played and he would interact with the fans. I think, I think a willingness to interact with the opposing fans is a, is a key to becoming but a if villain. South Carolina goes into Gainesville and their oh! player scores a touchdown and does the Gator yeah. chomp. That's a, that's a penalty, right? Right. And it's, stupid. why is that a penalty? I'll give you a great South Carolina example. And this is my favorite player growing up. When Steve Tannehill was a freshman at South Carolina, they went up to Clemson and beat Clemson. And he, after the game, on the 50-yard line, pretended to autograph the Tiger Paw. It's one of the most boss moves I've ever seen. Andy, after Ohio State lost to Oklahoma, what year was this? Oh, yeah. And Baker ran to midfield and planted planted the flag. I was like, oh, my God, that is awesome. Like, I saw it in person. I was like... This and and what was it? it was the it was the conversation of the week, yeah. And I don't know if that's bad, but like, was Baker Mayfield a villain? Yes, he was. I I think the best college or well, no, the best sports villains are the ones that if they're on your team, you will go to the ends of the earth to defend them, and if they're not mm-hmm. on your team, you hate them. And well, Terrell Owens was like game. the biggest villain in the NFL of the last twenty years, right? I would, yeah, I would say Chad so. Johnson, was he a villain? As long as he wasn't on your team, yeah. And you loved yeah, him I mean, if he was on your team. Terrell Owens ran to the middle of the star in the Dallas star. and slammed the football. Right. I, I think that I, they should honestly just be like, you know what? Do whatever you want. Yeah. I'd score a touchdown and keep running into the tunnel. Play with pom-poms. Pull cell phones out of, out of... You want to talk about an entertainment product. I'm with you. And if you I'm lose, you. you deal with it. That's part of losing. It's the same thing with, with Tom with Tom Herman was a villain. Oh, yeah. The backpack dance. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So here's the thing. I think most of the people listening to this podcast would agree with us on that. I think we, we, we sort of broadcast to a self-selecting sample of people who think similarly to us. But I think there's a lot of fans out there who would hear this and go, <gasps> how dare you encourage bad sportsmanship? Bad sportsmanship equals no fun. Yeah, have you seen the movie I, Basketball? I have. You know the opening scene? Yeah. Where the entire team gets together and river dances? Yes. Could you imagine how I, awesome I'm, that would be? I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Let's yeah. do it. All right. Jeremy wants to know, after enjoying and listening to your most recent podcast with Ari and Casey Smith, you guys talked about Lincoln Riley's house in L.A. Got at me wondering if you could pick one dream home for each Power 5 conference school's town slash general vicinity. Basically, he says within 10 miles. Plus one miscellaneous conference slash independent school. Which six houses are you picking? I answered this in the written Dear Andy. So uh, if you subscribe to The Athletic, you can go look that up. Uh, It came out on Thursday. 
Uh, if you don't subscribe to The Athletic, theathletic.com slash Andy Staples. Get your first six months for a buck a month. Come on. So I, I had some Zillow links to these houses. I, se- I sent them to Ari. Like, the Pac-12 is absolutely loaded. I, I told Ari before the show, I went to a, a work meeting one time at somebody's house in Berkeley that had one of the best views I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we, we, we talked all about Lincoln Riley's house. I, I actually found a house on the Strand in Manhattan Beach, which is a you know, little north on Sepulveda from where, where Lincoln Riley is. That Now, it's, it's $27 million, but it is right on the beach. It's uh, 5,300 square feet, five bed, eight bath. It's gorgeous. Uh, you're basically looking into the sunset over the Pacific every afternoon. I, I just, it, it's amazing. But also you could have a beautiful house in the Phoenix area, you know, cut into the side of a mountain if you wanted to do that. The Cliff I, I found one house. on Mercer Island in, in Washington. So Mercer Island is, it sits in the middle of Lake Washington. Lake Washington is the body of water that Washington's football stadium backs up to. Uh, <laughs> I found a $16.9 million house. It's a little big for my taste. I don't. I don't really need this much square footage, but since it's here, uh, fourteen thousand nine hundred forty square feet, five bed, eleven bath. This house is amazing. So you, you got that if you're at Washington. Uh, if you're at Cal, Berkeley has all those amazing views. There's a lot in the Pac-12 to pick from. Don't sleep on Boulder. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly or salt lake city like he said 10 miles if, if we could stretch it to like 28 you could get a place in park city yeah and obviously mountain views are the only views that can come close to ocean views and in certain right. settings that's why i love about california because you can get both you're both exactly um so but the pac-12 oh I mean, yeah come on and even stanford you said northern california right yeah yeah, Stanford. Who else am I forgetting? Air- Palo Tem- Alto does not have the best I mean, from a Berkeley. location standpoint. It's not. It's not as. It's not as breathtaking as say Berkeley. And San Francisco is a you know a bit of a haul. Yeah. So, yeah, but that's the beautiful views conference. If you could be a beat writer for one year and you could pick one conference and go on every road trip, what conference would you pick? Because it's undeniably that's the Mountain the West, one. right? It's yeah, it's the Pac-12 because you, you're going to a bunch of really cool places. Or Mountain uh, West. Mountain, well, Mount, yeah, you go to Hawaii. Yeah. That, that... Although our good friend Dave Ubbin told me that traveling to Hawaii as a beat writer sounds actually pretty miserable, <laughs> depending on how yeah. long you're there for. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of time crammed in and coach and yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of flight. So the Big Ten, I I went with Madison. Um, I love a good isthmus, and I found a place in Madison. Uh, it's it's a condo basically, uh, but it's it's gorgeous. It's uh, it's like two and a half million bucks. Uh, three bed, four bath, thirty five hundred square feet. But it, it basically, you have views of, of Lake Mendota. You have views of the Capitol. Uh, you can probably see Camp Randall from, from your, one of your windows. Uh, you can walk to all those amazing bars and restaurants that are around the university and around the Capitol building. I just, the, from a lifestyle standpoint, that would be a lot of fun. You don't have, and, and you do have the beautiful water view. The, it's not the Pacific Ocean, but it's, it's pretty nice. I mean, the undeniable uh, answer there is a... $30 million flat atop the highest building in Chicago. So that, that was the other thing is, is I went Northwestern and, and I looked, I actually looked around and, and it might be that the Chicago market right now is a little, little tough that there's just not as much available because I couldn't find as much. Cause I figured, okay, I'll just pick one in Chicago. That's, that's way up in the air and you're just like commuting Michigan. up. Yeah, you're commuting up Lakeshore Drive to, to work at Northwestern. I actually found a really beautiful house in Evanston for $3 million that it, that is on Lake Michigan that looks like a, a, a Swiss chalet. Like, it looks amazing. Uh, eight beds, six baths, 7,300 square feet. Again, probably a little big for me, but it's, it's pretty nice. I, although, I will say, I'm not sure the view from that house is as nice as the view from the Northwestern football facility. Yeah, no, the, the Northwestern football facility can get it. Um, the the Big Ten is is tough. Um, yeah, because now, honestly, the, the ace- I will say this: 
and I don't know if you'll agree with me, but the Pennsylvania okay. mountains are really pretty. They are beautiful. That you, I bet you could find a pretty gorgeous place near State College, like up on uh, up on a mountain a little bit. Yeah, it's hard to drive there for a road trip when it's snowing, but it's a beautiful place. And yeah. then Rutgers is too far away from Manhattan for it to count. I, yeah, that I checked that because I, I, I thought, okay, if it's close enough, then we're good. But it's it's really not. So um, okay, uh, ACC is is it's Miami, Miami, and yeah, I, the Lincoln Riley house at somewhere. A, I'm looking at a 35 million dollar penthouse uh, on Miami Beach. Uh, Andy, what's bedrooms. the canal called that's behind the beach where all the millionaires? Uh, they're they're not directly on to have a, a unobstructed view of the ocean, but right. they they are like a quarter of a mile off the ocean, and all of their houses um, have boat docks and right. jet ski docks that you can drive in Lake your boat. Pan Coast, and like or, there are all these mansions, and it's just like a stream. Well, and, and you could also you could also do like Star Island. You, all the the islands along the causeways have. But I saw a video of DJ too. Khaled just got went to the back of his mansion in in the south florida i don't know if it was sunny isle i, I don't know where it was um and he just got on a jet ski and drove on a jet ski for like 10 minutes and then like docked it at, at puff daddy's house then just like so had here, a drink with him on the dock and they're all I just like called up, i just called up a 90 million dollar house on star island six bed 12 bath 23,000 23,000 square feet this thing is i mean it looks like a mall <laughs> A really nice mall. I, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to West Palm Beach in July. Is West Palm 10 miles from Miami? No, or Coral Gables? No, no, and and I have and no concept of mileage with morning with morning traffic. You're talking about maybe two and a half hours, so yeah, but how long of a drive is it if you drove from Coral Gables to West Palm at midnight? At midnight, it'd be an hour and a half. Oh, it's that far, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you've got to go through the entirety of or most of Dade County and the entirety of Broward County. Okay. Yeah, you're Mr. Geography. I don't know. I don't know anything about how long it takes to drive places, but I'm going to West Palm for vacation with Britt um, in July, and we're flying into Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah. Like as you drive from the Fort Lauderdale air- airport up there, you'll be like, oh, this is really far. And then just remember that from the Fort Lauderdale airport to the UM campus during rush hour would take you an hour and a half. My brother used to live in Fort Lauderdale for a year. And I will say that it is one of the underrated, terrible traffic cities. It's bad, but it's also, I love that where the beach is in Fort Lauderdale that, and you could walk downtown from the beach. I mean, it's laid out pretty spectacularly if you are on foot or not trying to drive. Yourself. There's a bar in Fort Lauderdale called Elbow Room. Had some pretty mm-hmm. awesome nights there. Yeah, so it's 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 pretty spectacular. But I'll, uh, we'll take the ninety million dollar house in uh, on South Beach. Although, if you want to go lake living, if you want to go just a beautiful, you know, country atmosphere, some I found a North I found Carolina. a lot in Clemson on Lake Hartwell. A million dollars just for the property. It's not been developed yet. It's gorgeous. It is beautiful. And the other one, if you want to want big city living, you go to Atlanta, Georgia Tech, you get one of those mansions off West Paces Ferry Road. And I, I think the one I sent you is an absurd square foot. It's like 17,000 square feet. But it's, it's there are a lot simple. of really great lake houses in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, the thing is, in North Carolina, the, the goal is to have like a mountain house. So, like, you kind of want to take the Appalachian State job. Well, we have a miscellaneous. We do have a miscellaneous. And so for the miscellaneous, uh, Ari turned me on to this show. And you've heard us talking about it a few times. I watched Yellowstone. I've been the first four seasons this year. So I looked in Bozeman. And this is uh, the the name of the town is, is Gallatin Gateway, Montana. But it's, it's suburban Bozeman, essentially. So this is a 41-acre a piece of property with a 4,200-square-foot house on it. It's $5.2 million dollars. You have views of seven different mountain ranges, Ari. Yeah. I mean, how about just take uh, the main main house of the Yellowstone Ranch, the Dutton Ranch, and just that, call it a day. But I just there? don't know. I don't know how beautiful. Do we get to hang with I Beth, Beth. Beth Dutton? Do we, do we get to drink whiskey with Beth Dutton? I love we do, everything about that, Beth That's Dutton. a bonus. Flawless woman. 
Um, yeah, but I think that I don't know if Bozeman is quite as pretty as some of the places in the surrounding areas, like the hour north of it. Right, and that that's the thing. I mean, Montana, Wyoming, all of those places that just you're talking breathtakingly beautiful. So that that's that's a tough one, and and you know, Big Sky Conference, Mountain West Conference, and and again, Hawaii. If you if we went Mountain West, you could find some pretty spectacular places in Hawaii. So I think that what, what this really means is, Ari, we need to make millions of dollars as football coaches so we can buy sweet houses that we'll never well, see. Well, you forgot about the Big 12. I think you said Austin. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I in the Big 12, I had a, I picked a house on Lake Austin. Uh, Texas still in the Big 12. Because I, I, think, I think the go-to move, people think, oh, you're going to get a condo in downtown Austin so that you can go walk the road. No, no, no. Or, uh, you know, with me... Stereo, you know, I'm, I'm the barbecue guy. Oh, you're definitely going to get something in walking distance of Franklin. No, I'm driving to Franklin Barbecue's lunch. Like, I'm not, I'm not drunk yet. So, I'm going to live off Lake Austin, have the water, have some property. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. I would just pick Dallas because I live here, Fort Worth. But Fort Worth is further, it's 10 miles Fort Worth, away. Yeah, Fort Worth is, is really cool. It, and, and Fort Worth is a very cool town. Like, I think people not from there who haven't been there go oh you know it's just one they, they call it the metroplex you just assume it's like one big megalopolis but fort worth is a very different feel than dallas or oh yeah dallas it's completely suburbs. different yeah and i don't fit in really well in fort worth i went to the stockyards with Britt once and <laughs> <laughs> we'll get everyone's like who's this who's this guy yeah yeah uh, i i luke i i called uh the boot company lucchesi when we got there and it's and that was wrong that what's the boot company? It's called Lucchese. Lucchese? Yeah. Britt had a uh, work conference a month after uh, our baby was born in Fort Worth, and it was a beautiful hotel um, in the stockyards. And I showed up there, and it felt like the Dutton Ranch in there. You know, you had the the colorful prints and the fireplaces going and everything. And we thought, after your conference is over, we'll go out and have a nice dinner. Uh, we'll, we'll get a drink. This will be a wonderful like date night and then both of us got there and she came up to the hotel room after work and we're like you know what we're just gonna go to bed and it was like eight o'clock um yeah that's that's crazy but i just want to say before we wrap up andy my miscellaneous is mm -hmm. vegas and that's i don't a great know one and I, I know that you that you might be like well when you have hawaii and other places no, you, I, I I understand the 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 lure. If you of Vegas. look at some of these new builds that they're building in Vegas, like in Seven Hills and some of the surrounding areas in Summerlin and Henderson, it's the most forward thinking, um, just architecture work, where you have streams from the pool that go into the home, and they're mm -hmm. like on mountains looking out at the Vegas Strip, and you, it would just. You, I'm gonna send my, you a my neighbor video. and I when we when we put the pool in our house. My neighbor and I actually joked about knocking down the fence between our houses and creating a lazy river that would run yeah. between the two houses and into the so house. You can actually do that. That that's real. I'm going to send you this YouTube video when we're off the air. Uh, and I, maybe I'll post it with the podcast when it runs um, of this house. And I've watched, it's a 45 minute tour. And I was just thinking to myself, it's like a resort, but also like the, the uses of bodies of water or pool like things as, as features within In the, the inside of the house yeah. And then you open the back, you know, in Vegas, is the, this is the whole thing where you have a house and it's all indoors and then you can just open up the entire back door. So like your house is outside and inside at the same right. time. That's and, a, it just, and that's that's something that if you are in Nevada, Arizona, Florida, Louisiana, coastal, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, like the the idea of the garage, the glass garage door that you can just flip up. And, and I don't mean for your actual garage. I mean, on your living room, instead of the sliding glass, you just have the thing you flip up and then you have the indoor open outdoor. Air. Yeah. Cause it, like every restaurant in Phoenix has those because for six months out of the year, the weather's perfect. And that's what most of the new restaurants they build in Florida have those too. Yeah, just the new builds in Vegas are stunning. Yeah. You so know, Toll I, Brothers I, is. Yep. Where they, they tell you come on in and the houses are starting at five sixty nine and they show you a model that's two seven two point seven million. Uh, yes. Yeah. The the houses that are two point seven million are some of the most beautifully decorated, most elaborate backyards you'd ever come up 
hot but, tubs that, that but are off. That's the a lot bedroom. of money. That's more than either you or I could afford. But yet, bang right yet, but bang for your buck wise compared to some of these houses we're but talking this is dream about. Jobs or dream yeah. houses. I'm not yeah, thinking about. Exactly. I'm spending your money right now. Yeah. No, this is this is. Yeah, I mean, if we did a bang for your buck conference one, I think it would be much different. Well, no, I'm saying the Vegas one is a good is a oh, great yeah. bang for your buck compared to Seattle, compared Although to it's the Bay Area, compared too. to Los Angeles. Yeah, so I I'm now I'm now I'm all excited. Now I'm going back on Zillow. So it this is this has become a real estate podcast. By Andy the way. is a huge. I was listening to an investment podcast that one of our listeners sent us, and he said that real estate is the unparalleled investment because it's the only investment where. You, you have certain tax advantages like selling an asset and rolling over your profits into a new one without having to pay taxes, which doesn't exist uh, into uh, or you could regular... be a college athletic director and, and run a business where you don't have to pay taxes and, and someone pays you seven figures to assure you spend all the company's money every year and sometimes more than that. There's some people have it you know, better made than others. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're in the wrong business. Sorry. That's the one thing we keep learning. One of these days we'll be, be able to afford one of these houses, but it might not be while we're doing this. I think, we, I think we have it made day to day, but when you start, I was actually having this conversation with Dan Rubenstein at Solid Verbal of just like, Britt works with some people who make a lot of money. And sometimes I am just like, yeah, I mean, I get to talk about sports with Andy every day, which is great, but it wouldn't be terrible to be able to buy a vacation home in Hawaii or to drive a Rolls see, Royce Phantom to work. The key is, the key is to figure out how to like make industrial pipe and just dominate that industry yeah or be like the, become a this, become a legit billionaire the texas and, like uh king of astroturf exactly which hey i put down 700 square feet of artificial i didn't even want to ask you I, nearly broke me so we, we uh, did astroturf uh, in our backyard they wanted 35 grand for it yeah yeah so no I, I, that person's making some money but yeah we're, we're in the wrong line of work we, we we accept it, but one of these days we'll we'll I'm I'm gonna be hanging with you at one of those dream houses. You'll be tarpless. Oh yeah, and it's hold on, it's, it's coming off amazing. right now, bud. Just say goodbye <laughs> right. so I can take my shirt off. All right, we gotta go. Ari's half naked already. Talk to you soon.